Christmas Day, Bristol 2010. A couple walking their dog along a country lane made a startling discovery. It was the body of a 25-year-old woman called Joanna Yates. She'd been missing for eight days. When Joanna Yates's body was discovered, it was partially covered in snow, and she is partially undressed. She is found to have 43 injuries focused on the head and neck. Her ultimate cause of death is manual strangulation. A nationwide hunt for the missing landscape architect had come to a tragic end, and the prime murder suspect was Joanna's landlord and neighbour, Christopher Jeffries. When you're confronted with police telling you that you're under arrest on suspicion of murder, the shock is so great that really it's um, a question of feeling numb. But the police had arrested the wrong neighbor. The real killer was 32-year-old Dutch national Vincent Tabak. But he takes one life in a terrible way and then proceeds to try and convince the world that he could not possibly have had anything to do with it. It is an act of gross depravity in my mind. Vincent Tabak killed Joanna Yates to satisfy his sexual urges. Despite trying to cover his crimes and frame an innocent man, he was caught. The police proved him to be one of the world's most evil killers. December the 25th, 2010, Clifton, Bristol, in the southwest of England. The city should have been celebrating Christmas Day, but the news of a murdered woman stunned the local community and the nation. It's thought Joanna must have crossed or been taken across the bridge to the point where her body was found. Police are still searching that road, which runs beside a golf course, but no details have been disclosed of how or when she died. The police say they're treating Joanna's death as suspicious, but it is not yet a murder inquiry. I think one of the most heartbreaking elements of this case is the fact that it turned from a missing persons inquiry into a murder investigation. It was Christmas Day, there was snow on the ground, it was quite an exciting time, and we all wanted a happy ending to this case. Joanna's killer was 32-year-old Vincent Tabak, a Dutch engineer who had an obsession with hardcore sex and violent pornography. He was obsessed with sadomasochistic pornography. He would watch at length pornography that was dedicated to the proposition of binding women, torturing women, humiliating women. After Joanna rejected his advances, Tabak strangled the 25-year-old to death in her own flat and then dumped her body in a country lane three miles away from where they both lived. Reporter Claire Hayhurst worked on the case. The disappearance of Joanna Yates became front page news very quickly. I think part of that was because people were looking forward to celebrating with their loved ones at Christmas time and everybody was thinking of this woman who was missing from her family at such an important time of year. The police, in their attempt to try and find the killer, arrested the wrong man, Joanna's landlord, Christopher Jeffries. The worst part of the experience was um, when I um, started to read the sort of reports in the press, the sort of hideously distorted image of somebody purporting to be me. That was the image which had been projected nationally and indeed to a degree internationally. Eventually, Tabak was arrested, but the calculated killer continued to deny that he had anything to do with the murder. His own family, his girlfriend, his girlfriend's family were absolutely convinced that he was innocent, so he was able to, to maintain this facade of normality, this idea that he was this gentle giant, this innocent person. And I think when you can fool those closest to you, you're potentially a very dangerous person. He 
He's never perpetrated a sexual assault. He's never attacked anyone. He's never raped another woman. He seems to have moved from law-abiding citizen to calculated first-degree premeditated murder all in one step. This killer's story begins in 1978. Vincent Tabak was born on the 10th of February in Fekkel in the south of the Netherlands. He grew up in the town of Uden near Eindhoven and was the youngest of five children. His parents were quite a bit older than the parents of his peers and he had quite a solitary upbringing. And his relationships with his fellow pupils at school, the kids in the community, they weren't that great. So he was a bit of a loner. He wasn't desperately gregarious. He kept himself to himself. He didn't play with other children. He was kind of reserved, but he was undoubtedly clever. Tabak came from a, a good, caring family. The only thing that we know about him psychologically as a child was he was a bit of a loner, and that is very common for people who have sexual pathology, especially if it's what I would call secretive sexual pathology. So no indications of a traumatic event being the cause of his disturbance. I think one of the things about Tabak and emerges through his adolescence is that he was probably fascinated by pornography from a very early age. Young Vincent struggled to fit in with his peers, but he was an exceptionally bright child. The thing is, he was developing quite quickly intellectually. He did incredibly well in school. But those social skills that we all have to develop, he wasn't developing those as quickly as he was developing his aptitude for academic subjects. So there was something that was a little bit odd about him. Nevertheless, Tabak continued to excel academically. And in 1996, aged 18, he went to study architecture, building and planning at the prestigious Eindhoven University of Technology. It was here that he was exposed to the city's red light district. Well, when Tabak was at university, he lived in an area opposite the red light district. I think there was a fascination that he had with these women because he hadn't really been exposed to intimate relationships. He was quite socially stunted in terms of his development. Tabak thrived in higher education and went on to earn his PhD. No question, a talented young man. If a bit, how can one put it politely, removed from the world. Even in his late 20s, Tabak continued to struggle with forming relationships, especially with those from the opposite sex. He certainly found relationships with women very difficult. There is very little evidence that he had any girlfriends. I think he saw women as objects and had done so from quite an early age. In 2007, while studying for his PhD, Tabak found work at Burrow Happold, an engineering company in Bath, England. So he's working for a company that specialise in exploring how people move through public spaces, so sports stadiums, schools, places like that. There's a lot of science behind it, so I think it suits Tabak down to the ground. A year later, in 2008, tragedy struck for Tabak when his father, also an engineer, died. The 30-year-old continued to work for the same company in Bath. I think Tabak's first real job was a, a learning experience for him. So he's spending time with, with people who perhaps haven't had the, the same experience that he has, um, being at, at university for nearly a decade, living a, a rather kind of solitary life. He's being exposed to, to new people, new behaviours, and he's looking at how people behave in social situations. And because he's very bright, he's picking up on this. He's realising what's appropriate, what's not appropriate in particular circumstances, and he's starting to mirror the behaviour of other people. And in November 2008, he even met a woman and they began dating. The couple met through The Guardian's online dating site. Perhaps predictable in a way, given the fact that Tabak was very reserved when it came to women. Now, bear in mind that he's 30 at this point, so his development is a little bit behind what would be considered normal and average. And he meets his first girlfriend online, and that, for me, is actually quite interesting because you don't have that same kind of social pressure that you do in a face-to-face -face environment. 
the relationship flourished, and after just seven months, the couple decided to move in together. In June 2009, the couple moved to Clifton in Bristol to an upmarket hilltop suburb and rented a flat from Christopher Jeffries, a retired English teacher. Well, one of the garden flats became vacant and a letting agent told me that they had signed up this couple. Christopher recalls the first time he met Tabac. He was physically quite tall and imposing, but in manner comparatively gentle and fairly deferential, um, quite reserved. He always struck me and I think other people in the building as very, very pleasant, very respectful um, in his manner. Life for Tabak was going well. He'd secured a reputable job, he was in a stable relationship, and had settled into a new city. He lived in a delightful part of town. He had a very good job and he was on his way up. He had a good social life, he vacationed. But the 31-year-old engineer was hiding something sinister. He was leading a double life. Whilst he was away on business trips, Tabak was interested in women soliciting sex. There was one trip to Newcastle in the northeast of England, and there were records of him looking up the local sex trade, looking up escorts, looking up sex workers. So this was, was something that, that he would indulge in when he was away. So this is a person who has lived in the world, at least in his fantasy, of sexual domination. Tabac was also a regular consumer of online hardcore pornography. A man who took a great interest in escort agencies, in pornographic websites, some of them involving the abduction, torture of women, and indeed some of the others involving the abuse of children. I think that there is very often that connection made between consuming violent pornography and being a sexual predator and being a violent individual. But I think for Tabak, this didn't cause his violent behaviour. I think when he was consuming this violent pornography, it simply reinforced these existing values and attitudes and beliefs that he had about women. So what we have is a hidden man. We have the man on the surface who goes to Bristol gets on the train to Bath and comes home in a steady relationship. And you have the secret tabac, the tabac who is hidden beneath the surface, who exists on the web and exists in front of his computers. Here is the tabac that is about to come out, the genie in the bottle, if you prefer, in the twilight world in which his girlfriend knows nothing about. On October the 25th, 2010, another young couple rented a garden flat from Christopher Jeffries. Now, this flat was located in the same house as the flat occupied by Vincent Tabac and his girlfriend. The new tenants were 25-year-old Joanna Yates, a landscape architect who was originally from Hampshire, and her boyfriend, 27-year-old Greg, also an architect from Sheffield. They both worked at the same firm in Bristol and started dating in 2008. They were living together for the, for the first time. Um, they were obviously very much in love with each other. Joanna Yates was a very clever, very ambitious woman, and she was working as a, a landscape architect, and her, her work took her to Bristol. Joe struck me as being a slightly nervous young woman. Um, she was um, very, very attractive. Again, very pleasant to deal with, but a little bit nervous in manner. She was the sort of person, for example, if I had to go and speak to her, would hesitate for a little before deciding whether or not to invite me in. Although they were neighbours, Tabac and Joanna Yates didn't have any interaction with each other. Now, I believe that Tabak was fascinated by his next door neighbour and increasingly fascinated by her. She represented the figure that he'd seen on the net. He would like to have some kind of sexual relationship with her. She, however, was entirely unaware of his interest in her. 
On the 6th of November, Tibak went on another business trip, this time to America. And once again, he was looking at adult escort websites. So he's playing the role of the committed partner, the devoted boyfriend at home, and then there's this other side to him, the real side to him, that comes out when he's on his own and he doesn't have those controls over his behaviour. Unable to control his sexual fantasies, Tabak made contact with an escort. He goes to a motel in San Luis Obispo, about 150 miles north of uh, Los Angeles, and hires a, a girl and pays her $200. Again, he's ostensibly working, and yet, in that twilight world that he inhabited, he's making contacts with escorts, prostitutes. I would say that Tabak had an obsession with what sex represented. I think for him, it represented power, it represented control, it represented an opportunity for, for him to, to see himself as, as important because these women were there to serve him. And I think that's a value that he continued to develop over many years. After five weeks away, Tabak returned to Bristol. The 11th of December in 2010, Tabak comes back from California, back to his girlfriend. On the surface, nothing has altered one iota, except something has. Tabak's secret addiction to violent pornography and sex was escalating by the day. I think that Tabak was essentially a bomb waiting to go off, a bomb fueled by an addiction to pornography, not fueled by alcohol or drugs, but simply the addictions of pornography, which I've always believed is potentially every bit as dangerous. Across the hallway, new tenants, Joanna Yates and her boyfriend, Greg, had now settled into their new life in Bristol. They'd made friends and were preparing for the festive period. During the day of December the 17th, Jo had gone out to lunch with her boyfriend, Greg. He was going away to Sheffield for the weekend. Greg kissed Joanna goodbye and then made his way to the north of England to see his family. Little did they know it would be the last time they would see each other. Joanna was now home, alone. I gather she had told friends that she was a little bit nervous about spending the weekend on her own uh, without Greg, and I think she had been intending to do some cooking or some baking in preparation for Christmas. Coincidentally, Tabak's girlfriend, tells Vincent Tabak that she's going to be going to a works party and it won't finish until the early hours of the following morning. It was agreed that Tabak would pick his girlfriend up after her party. At approximately 6 p.m. that same evening, his neighbour Joanna left work and made her way to see some friends for some Christmas drinks. Perfectly innocently, Joanna goes out for a drink with some friends in the Ram pub in Bristol. She was there for about two hours and she then made her way back up to Clifton where she lived. At around 8.10 p.m., Joanna went into a supermarket but didn't buy anything. Approximately 20 minutes later, she called her friend before heading to two other shops where she bought pizza and cider. With her shopping done, Joanna then made her way home. In one of the most chilling moments in this case, Joanna Yates encounters a priest walking his dog and he conducts a conversation. It was a, you know, a week before Christmas. It was a very uplifting, cheerful time. People were looking to celebrate and to celebrate the season. After talking briefly about the weather with the priest, Joanna then headed to her flat. The last sighting of her is from some CCTV footage from a pub just 600 yards from her home, and it shows her walking home alone. Joanna made it back to her flat at approximately 8.37. Her neighbour, Vincent Tabak, was also home alone and decided to pay her a visit. But he wasn't there to be neighbourly, as Joanna would soon find out. I presume she opened the door willingly and there was her neighbour, though they were not by any means friends. 
Now, at some point during this evening, Tabak enters her flat. We're never gonna know exactly what happened here, but it's likely that the entry wasn't forced. Joanna probably let him in. He was one of her neighbors. She was a trusting individual. It was to prove a terrible mistake. Once inside the flat, Tabak made sexual advances towards the 25-year-old. And at some point during that interaction, Joanna Yates realizes, oh crikey, this is, this is turning nasty. Joanna rejected the unwanted attention from Tabak, something that only angered him further, and he attacked her. At about 10 to 9 that evening, a couple attending a party near Joe's flat in Canning Road in Bristol heard a woman scream twice. Now, those screams almost certainly came from Joanna Yates. As Joanna tried to fight to back off, the 32-year-old placed his hands around her neck and started to strangle the defenceless woman. Most people know what it feels like to choke on something, to find it difficult to breathe. For that situation to be suddenly inflicted on you out of the blue by another human being would be terrifying, confusing, distressing. And she ends up with over 40 injuries to her body. It's a horrifying, horrifying thought that a young woman just back from celebrating the coming of Christmas with her friends should be snuffed out by this loner next door who is uh, hiding another individual, hiding Mr Hyde in the plain sight of Dr Jekyll. And literally, in one fell swoop, he's wiped out the life of, of this individual who had so much hope and so much promise. Shortly after killing Joanna, Tabak sent his girlfriend a text message. He then went about covering up the murder in a seemingly calm and calculated fashion. After Tabak murdered Joanna Yates, he starts to clean up very quickly. He carries, and this must have taken quite a considerable effort, he carries the body of Joanna Yates out and puts it into the boot of his Renault McGann car. He sets about constructing an alibi for himself. So he drives to a, a local Asda supermarket where I think he knows he's going to be seen on CCTV. Tabak wandered around the supermarket but left without buying anything. CCTV footage then captured him returning to buy crisps, beer and rock salt. And I think probably he bought those items because he was hungry and because he wanted a drink. Here's somebody who is very self-obsessed, so he's going to do the things that he wants when he wants to do them. With Joanna's body still in the boot of his car, Tabak casually sent his girlfriend another text message at 10.30 p.m. And bored is a word that tends to come up quite a lot with Tabak. He's bored quite often. Uh, and for me, that's quite interesting because that's one of the, the key characteristics of, of psychopathy, that proneness to boredom, that need for stimulation. By now, he's in Asda with the McGann parked in the car park with the dead body of Joanna Yates in it. Most people, when they commit murder, are absolutely horrified by what they've done. They are not able to function normally whatsoever. But Vincent Tabak is, is just something altogether different. With his shopping complete, the sadistic killer left the supermarket to dispose of Joanna's body. At some point later that evening, he drives the car about three miles to a lane in Feyland. He parks beside a, a stone wall guarding a quarry. He opens the boot, gets Joanna's body out, and he lifts her out and tries to throw her over the wall. But he finds he can't quite manage it. So in the end, he dumps her on the roadside, covers her with leaves and snow. Tabak then drove three miles to his flat. The way he goes about covering up this murder is so systematic. He's literally going through the, the problem and the solution process. So he goes away from the supermarket, he dumps her body, covers it with snow, and then just drives home and gets on with the rest of his festive period. He's just got absolutely no regard for her as a human being. Once home, Tabak turned on his computer. 
He began almost immediately doing two things, watching more pornography, much of it related and similar to what he'd perpetrated that night, and doing legal research. And he starts looking up sentences for murder versus manslaughter. Which sentence is going to be more severe? What's the difference between the two? So he's very much concerned for himself at this point in time. He was already beginning to plot out, if he was caught, how he would twist the facts in order to make it a manslaughter. He researched the temperature and rate of body decomposition. In short, he did everything conceivable to plan for an escape because he was aware that getting caught was a real possibility. Joanna's boyfriend, Greg, unaware of her tragic fate, tried calling her at 10.30 p.m., but there was no response, and he left her a text message asking her if she'd had a good time in the pub. Just after 1.30 a.m., the brazen killer, Tabac, continued to play the role of the doting boyfriend and went to pick his girlfriend up from her work's Christmas party. And guess what? They go and collect a takeaway. What she doesn't know and can't know is that he'd taken the life of their next-door neighbour, Joe Yates. With several unanswered messages and calls, Joanna's anxious boyfriend drove back to Bristol on the evening of the 19th of December, but there was no sign of her in the flat. But Joanna's keys, purse, mobile phone, they're all there, as are two undrunk bottles of cider. Put yourself in his shoes. You walk in expecting to see your girlfriend and the place is empty. It must have been a most dreadful shock. Greg called Joanna's parents, but they had no idea where she was. Concerned for her safety, they drove to Bristol that evening. Next, Greg then dialed 999, and at 4.15 a.m., along with a policeman, they knocked on Tabak's door, asking if he'd seen Joanna. Tabak brushes it off. No idea. Haven't seen her. His girlfriend, of course, knows nothing at all, because she wasn't there. There is an element to this story that I think is chilling, and that is Tabak's capacity to deceive. Here is a man who knows full well that he has just taken his neighbour's life, but presents to his girlfriend, whom is clearly fond of him, as if butter wouldn't melt in his mouth. The police found the receipt for the pizza that Joanna had bought less than an hour before she was murdered, but bizarrely, the pizza and the packaging were nowhere to be seen. With no leads, a missing persons inquiry was launched nearly three days after Joanna had disappeared. Her frantic family had a painful wait ahead of them. The killer was hiding in plain sight, and his behavior after the murder was peculiar. In the days after Tabak committed the murder, looking at his internet history is, is quite interesting. He was continuing to watch violent pornography. He was following developments in the Joanna Yates missing person case. So he wants to stay on top of what's happening because for Tabak, staying in control is very important to him. He needs to know exactly what's going on. With no news of their daughter, Joanna's concerned parents appealed for her safe return four days after she was missing. When I got to the first press conference, I remember her family coming in the room as well as her boyfriend, Greg, and it immediately struck me just how distraught and upset they were. Over the next few days, with no sign of Joanna, the police continued to search her flat, and on the 23rd of December, they searched the other flats in the building, including Vincent Tabax, but found nothing. There were fairly detailed searches of the gardens around the, the property, all the flats. In the end, sniffer dogs were brought in um, to see if they could um, find any traces of anything that uh, might be connected with Joe. The killer continued with the facade and went to spend time with his girlfriend's parents in Cambridge. On Christmas Eve, the police contacted Tabak again, asking where he was on the night of Joanna's disappearance. He claimed that he was home all evening. With the media pressure mounting, the police had no other leads on Joanna's disappearance. 
I remember the parents of Jo Yates, I think her dad said how she loved Christmas. And I know the feeling at the time across the country, probably across the world, was people were just willing her to come home, to be reunited with her family in time for Christmas. But sadly, that wasn't to be. At approximately 9 a.m. on Christmas Day, two dog walkers found a body nearly three miles from Joanna's flat. Joanna's body is discovered in its shallow grave of leaves and twigs and snow in the lane. The search to find Joanna's killer became one of the largest police operations in Bristol. Over 100 hours of surveillance footage was examined and 293 tonnes of rubbish near Joanna's flat was seized. A national newspaper even offered a reward of £50,000, but there were no leads. The police then turned their attention to the night Joanna disappeared. With no signs of forced entry into Joanna's flat, the police were certain that Joanna knew her killer and they thought that person had to be her landlord. I had gone away to spend Christmas with one of my cousins as I was on my way back to Bristol. The following morning, there was a loud knock on the door of my flat with the police saying that they needed to talk to me. It came completely out of the blue. I had no idea that I might be a suspect, but when you're confronted with police at seven o'clock in the morning telling you that you're under arrest on suspicion of the murder of um, one of your tenants. The shock is so great that really it's a question of feeling numb. There isn't, I think, any opportunity to, to feel anything else. Christopher was arrested five days after Joanna's body was found and the news broke quickly. People were very, very quick to assume that Christopher Jeffries was guilty. This really was trial by media, and the outcome was decided very, very quickly. And this guy had his reputation absolutely ruined, literally overnight. People had decided that this was what a murderer looked like. And when that has been put out there, when the public have kind of got on board with that, it's very, very difficult to, to gain your reputation back. One person watching the news with great interest was Vincent Tabak, who travelled to the Netherlands to spend New Year with his family. Tabak had seemingly got away with murder, but he was about to make a vital mistake. Well, Vincent Tabak, after Christopher Jeffries was arrested, saw a narrative developing. He saw that Christopher Jeffries had been labelled as a murderer and he literally could not help himself. He wanted to, to help this storyline along. So he called the police and he said, well, yeah, actually, I remember now that my landlord was out and about on the evening that Joanna Yates disappeared. And I saw that his car was parked the other way round the next morning and, and wasn't that strange. Keen to hear his version of events on the 31st of December, a detective flew out to Amsterdam to speak to him. But for Tabac, it didn't quite go to plan. The detective arrives at the hotel and spends around six hours with Tabac, and she becomes very, very suspicious of him because he's very curious about the investigation. He wants to know an awful lot about it, especially when it comes to the forensic tests that have been carried out. And she cottons on to the fact that he's taking this information and he's then using it in, in particular ways. So he starts to give a slightly different version of his story. He starts to say, well, actually, I didn't just go out once on the evening that Joanna disappeared. I went out twice. I went out to Asda and then I went out to take pictures of the snow. And she thinks that this is, this is quite bizarre. And, and he's also starting to, to say, oh, I may have been inside Joanna Yates' flat at some point, and he'd never said this before. She becomes convinced that there is far more to this and to Tabak than meets the eye. And crucially, she asks him if she can take a DNA swab. This was a very experienced detective. She knew exactly what was going on here. And she got DNA and she got fingerprints from him. And he gave those willingly, um, but he, he seemed a little bit concerned. Uh, and I think this did seal his fate. On the 1st of January 2011, 
Christopher Jeffries was released on bail and the following day a slightly anxious Tabac returned to Bristol. The police now had his DNA on file and saliva had been found on Joanna's body. It was only a matter of time before they traced the results back to him. By the 20th of January, the police had now gathered enough evidence to arrest Vincent Tabak for the murder of Joanna Yates. Vincent Tabak's DNA was found on Joanna Yates's body and traces of her blood were found in his car. So this is very, very compelling evidence. Now, Tabak's reaction to this when he was arrested was to basically construct himself as the victim and say, these forensic scientists, they're, they're all corrupt. They've been taking bribes. They, they've set me up here. Christopher Jeffries has been wrongly accused. Now, I've been wrongly accused as well. The calculated killer continued playing the innocent victim, even manipulating those close to him. He had convinced his girlfriend and his girlfriend's family that he was completely innocent to the extent that they set up a fund to pay for his defence. Here was this gentle giant, this, this intellectual, quiet, introspective guy who, who wouldn't hurt a fly. With Tabak now in custody, the police searched his flat and seized his four computers. What they would find would give them an insight into the mind of the killer and his sadistic sexual fantasies. They find the pornography. They find the bound women. They find the women being bundled into the boot of the car. Some of the images that Tabak had on his computer stood out for the police because of their similarity to Joanna Yates and the way in which her body was found. One in particular of the pornographic sites he visited contained an image of a blonde-haired woman pulling up her top to expose her breasts. Now, chilling though it may sound, Joanna's top had been lifted up and part of her right breast exposed, exactly like the website that Tabak had uh, accessed. On the 21st of January, Vincent Tabak was charged with the murder of Joanna Yates. He had fooled everyone, even the man he tried to frame. I was absolutely astonished. My first reaction was that probably the police were again grasping at straws and here was somebody else who would turn out to be entirely innocent because certainly absolutely nothing in his manner, in his behaviour, would lead me to have any inkling of suspicion that he might be capable of that in the slightest. Tabak was sent to Bristol Prison, then Long Lartin in Worcestershire, whilst he was waiting for his trial. By now, his girlfriend had withdrawn her support for him. Realising that he was now on his own, on the 8th of February, 19 days after his arrest, the killer gave a chilling confession to a prison chaplain. Now, he hasn't suddenly grown a conscience overnight. He's had a couple of weeks inside. He's become aware of the strength of the evidence against him. He realises that he needs to change his version of the story to secure the best possible outcome for himself. So he, he admits that, that he's responsible for her death. But he doesn't admit to murder. He says this was manslaughter. And he starts to twist the story. So he says, she was flirting with me. She was coming on to me. Poor me, I'm the victim. And she freaked out when I tried to kiss her and I just reacted. I couldn't help it. The original suspect, Christopher Jeffries, was released from police bail on March the 4th and cleared of all charges just over two months after he was originally arrested. Two months later, on the 5th of May, Vincent Tabak admitted to the manslaughter of Joanna Yates in court, but denied the charge of murder. His trial took place on the 4th of October 2011 at Bristol Crown Court. During the course of his testimony, Tabak gave his version of events from that fateful night. Vincent Tabak told Bristol Crown Court that he had uh, gone into Joe's flat after spotting her through the window. She'd apparently had her blind up. He said they'd both chatted about the fact that their partners were away and they were bored. 
He claims that Joanna came on to him. She'd been leading him on. She'd been encouraging him. She'd been flirting with him. And that, that he'd gone to kind of follow up on that. And he said that Jo then made a flirty comment about her cat. And he made a pass at her. He grabbed her and tried to kiss her. And he said it was then that she started to scream loudly. And he asked her to stop, and she wouldn't. And he said he then put his hands around her throat and, and started to strangle her in, in an attempt to control her. Um, and he said that suddenly, after about 20 seconds, she had gone limp and fallen to the ground. There was a moment in the trial that I think will stay with everybody in that courtroom for a long period of time. Vincent Tabak's defence barrister asked him to act out effectively the period of time in which he'd spent strangling Joe. And I remember us counting together those 20 seconds and it feeling like an awfully long time. Tabak's defence was that it was manslaughter, not murder. To inflict 43 injuries upon a person takes time, takes effort, it is physically demanding. And the length of time that pressure has to be applied to the neck after a person is unconscious, you have minutes to realize that the person is not responding, but yet Tabak is maintaining that pressure long after it would be necessary just to subdue somebody. To suggest that he wasn't intending for her to end up dead is just entirely implausible. The notion that he would think a jury would be naive enough to believe that story while the autopsy indicated that she had 43 wounds on her body, most of which around her neck, would tell anyone this was a strangulation. On the 28th of October, after four days of deliberating, the jury found Vincent Tabak guilty of murdering Joanna Yates. In sentencing him, Mr Justice Field said, I think there is a sexual element to this killing. In my view, you are very dangerous. In my opinion, you are a thoroughly deceitful, dishonest and manipulative. And I think those words are very helpful to describe Vincent Tabak. Tabak was given a life sentence with a minimum of 20 years. Justice was finally served for Joanna and her family. In addition to the charge of murder, in March 2015, Tabak was also charged with possessing over 140 indecent images of children, and 10 months were added to his sentence. He remains in HMP, Long Latin. Vincent Tabak is somebody who is duplicitous. He is cold and he's calculating and he's incredibly narcissistic. It's about me, myself and I. I think what I can say for sure is that he would definitely have gone on to harm other people. It's all about pursuing his own desires and his own wants. If he had gotten away with this, then there would have been absolutely no impetus on him to change his behaviour, to address those underlying values and attitudes and beliefs. He still would have been misogynistic. He still would have been violent and entitled, and somebody would have been harmed by him. He had every opportunity in life, and he forsake that and destroyed his life, Yates's life, her boyfriend's life, and the life of his own girlfriend. He only takes one life, but he takes it in a, a terrible way and then proceeds to try and convince the world that uh, he could not possibly have had anything to do with it. It is an act of gross depravity in my mind. Tabak killed a bright young woman who had her whole life ahead of her just because he couldn't control his depraved urges. He deceived those closest to him and let an innocent man take the blame for a murder he didn't commit. Undoubtedly, Vincent Tabak is one of the world's most evil killers.